Let us explain the nature of winds and all windy vapors, also of rivers and of the sea. But here, too, we must first discuss the difficulties involved. For, as in other matters, so in this, no theory has been handed down to us that the most ordinary man could not have thought of. Some say that what is called air, when it is in motion and flows, is wind, and that this same air, when it condenses again, becomes cloud and water, implying that the nature of wind and water is the same. So they define wind as a motion of the air. Hence some, wishing to say a clever thing, assert that all the winds are one wind, because the air that moves is in fact all of it one and the same. They maintain that the winds appear to differ owing to the region from which the air may happen to flow on each occasion, but really do not differ at all. This is just like thinking that all rivers are one and the same river, and the ordinary unscientific view is better than a scientific theory like this. If all rivers flow from one source, and the same is true in the case of the winds, there might be some truth in this theory. But if it is no more true in the one case than in the other, this ingenious idea is plainly false. What requires investigation is this, the nature of wind and how it originates, its efficient cause, and whence they derive their source. Whether one ought to think of the wind as issuing from a sort of vessel and flowing until the vessel is empty, as if let out of a wineskin, or as painters represent the winds, as drawing their source from themselves. We find analogous views about the origin of rivers. It is thought that the water is raised by the sun and descends in rain and gathers below the earth and so flows from a great reservoir, all the rivers from one or each from a different one. No water at all is generated, but the volume of the rivers consists of the water that is gathered into such reservoirs in winter. Hence, Rivers are always fuller in winter than in summer, and some are perennial, others not. Rivers are perennial where the reservoir is large and so enough water has collected in it to last out and not be used up before the winter rain returns. When the reservoirs are smaller, there is less water in the rivers and they are dried up and their vessel empty before the fresh rain comes on. But if anyone will picture to himself a reservoir adequate to the water, that is continuously flowing day by day, and consider the amount of the water, it is obvious that a receptacle that is to contain all the water that flows in the year would be larger than the earth, or, at any rate, not much smaller. Though it is evident that many reservoirs of this kind do exist in many parts of the earth, yet it is unreasonable for anyone to refuse to admit that air becomes water in the earth for the same reason as it does above it. If the cold causes the vaporous air to condense into water above the earth, we must suppose the cold in the earth to produce this, this same effect, and recognize that there not only exists in it and flows out of it actually formed water, but that water is continually forming in it too. Again, even in the case of the water that is not being formed from day to day but exists as such, we must not suppose, as some do, that rivers have their source in definite subterranean lakes. On the contrary, just as above the earth, small drops form and these join others, till finally the water descends in a body as rain, so too we must suppose that in the earth the water at first trickles together little by little, and that the sources of the rivers drip, as it were, out of the earth and then unite. This is proved by facts. When men construct an aqueduct, they collect the water in pipes and trenches, as if the earth and the higher ground were sweating the water out. Hence, too, the headwaters of rivers are found to flow from mountains, and from the greatest mountains there flow the most numerous and greatest rivers. Again, most springs are in the neighborhood of mountains and of high ground, whereas, if we accept rivers, water rarely appears in the plains. For mountains and high ground, suspended over the country like a saturated sponge, make the water ooze out and trickle together in minute quantities, but in many places. They receive a great deal of water falling as rain, for it makes no difference whether a spongy receptacle is concave and turned up or convex and turned down. In either case, it will contain the same volume of matter. And they also cool the vapor that rises and condense it back into water. Hence, as we said, we find that the greatest rivers flow from the greatest mountains. This can be seen by looking at itineraries. 
what is recorded in them consists either of things which the writer has seen himself, or of such as he has compiled after inquiry from those who have seen them. In Asia, we find that the most numerous and greatest rivers flow from the mountain called Parnassus, admittedly the greatest of all mountains towards the southeast. When you have crossed it, you see the outer ocean, the further limit of which is unknown to the dwellers in our world. Besides other rivers, there flow from it the Bactris, the Coopses, the Araxes. From the last, a branch separates off and flows into Lake Maotis as the Tanais. From it, too, flows the Indus, the volume of whose stream is greatest of all rivers. From the Caucasus flows the Phasis, and very many other great rivers besides. Now the Caucasus is the greatest of the mountains that lie to the northeast, both as regards its extent and its height. A proof of its height is the fact that it can be seen from the so-called deeps and from the entrance to the lake. Again, the sun shines on its peaks for a third part of the night before sunrise and again after sunset. Its extent is proved by the fact that thought contains many inhabitable regions which are occupied by many nations and in which there are said to be great lakes. Yet they say that all these regions are visible up to the last peak. From Pyrene, this is a mountain toward the west in Celtici, there flow the Istris and the Tartessus. The latter flows outside the pillars, while the Istris flows through all Europe into the Euxini. Most of the remaining rivers flow northwards from the Hercynian Mountains, which are the greatest in height and extent about that region. In the extreme north, beyond further Scythia, are the mountains called Rife. The stories about their size are altogether too fabulous. However, they say that the most and, after the Istris, the greatest rivers flow from them. So too, in Libya, there flow from the Ethiopian mountains the Egon and the Nices, and from the so-called Silver Mountain, the two greatest of named rivers, the river called Kremitis, that flows into the outer ocean and the main source of the Nile. Of the rivers in the Greek world, the Achilus flows from Pindus, the Inachus from the same mountain, the Strymon, the Nestus, and the Hebrus, all three from Scombrus. Many rivers, too, flow from Rodope. All other rivers would be found to flow in the same way, but we have mentioned these as examples. Even where rivers flow from marshes, the marshes in almost every case are found to lie below mountains or gradually rising ground. It is clear, then, that we must not suppose rivers to originate from definite reservoirs. For the whole earth, we might almost say, would not be sufficient any more than the region of the clouds would be if we were to suppose that they were fed by actually existing water only, and that were not the case that, as some water passed out of existence, some more came into existence. But rivers always drew their stream from an existing store. Secondly, the fact that rivers rise at the foot of mountains proves that a place transmits the water it contains by gradual percolation of many drops, little by little, and that this is how the sources of rivers originate. However, there is nothing impossible about the existence of such places containing a quantity of water like lakes, only they cannot be big enough to produce the supposed effect. To think that they are is just as absurd as if one were to suppose that rivers drew all their water from the sources we see, for most rivers do flow from springs. So it is no more reasonable to suppose those lakes to contain the whole volume of water than these springs. That there exist such chasms and cavities in the earth, we are taught by the rivers that are swallowed up. They are found in many parts of the earth. In the Peloponnesus, for instance, there are many such rivers in Arcadia. The reason is that Arcadia is mountainous, and there are no channels from its valleys to the sea. So these places get full of water, and this, having no outlet, under the pressure of the water that is added above, finds a way out for itself underground. In Greece, this kind of thing happens on quite a small scale, but the lake at the foot of the Caucasus, which the inhabitants of these parts call a sea, is considerable. Many great rivers fall into it, and it has no visible outlet but issues below the earth off the land of the Caraxi, about the so-called deeps of Pontus. This is a place of unfathomable depth in the sea. At any rate, no one has yet been able to find the bottom there by sounding. At this spot, about 300 stadia from land, there comes up sweet water over a large area, not all of it together, but in three places. And in Liguria, a river equal in size to the Rodanus is swallowed up and appears again elsewhere, the Rodanus being a navigable river. 